so tonight it gives me special pleasure to introduce our speaker, Brianna Barger Kamate. Uh, she's a doctor who grew up here in our Lee, in our backyard. Uh, went to Mali while working for the National Institute of Health. Shortly after she earned a double uh, degree here in French and political science. Um, I'm particularly proud of the political science part of it. Um, and that makes two in a row that we had uh, here giving these lectures who were French and political science double majors. Um, she was accepted into the Fogarty International Health Scholars Program after her third year of medical school with the Wandy Program. And that led to her return to Mali in the fall of 2007. And while she was there, she created the Mali Medical Relief Fund, a fund that supports five facilities in Mali. Uh, Brianna also received the Johns Hopkins Pediatric Emergency Fellowship while working for residency at Johns Hopkins University. Right now, she is an attending physician at Providence Sacred Heart in Spokane. Washington. And you know, I have to give Brianna a little special credit here tonight because we've been doing this lecture series all winter. We had India, we had Haiti, we had Zambia, and it was cold and it was snowy and it was miserable. Now we have Mali and spring has finally come. So thank you for bringing <laughs> spring to us. So please join me in welcoming Brianna. warm uh, welcome. I'm really honored to be here tonight. I saw that uh, last week's was done by a MacArthur Genius Grant awardee, so I certainly, that was a little intimidating to be coming after the call in that, so I hope I don't disappoint. Um, I entitled my talk, uh, Montana to Mali and Back Again, and it's my journey essentially to a career in global health and how I founded an organization called Mali Medical Relief Fund that sponsors medical care for needy families and patients in Mali. So I grew up in Arley, Montana, and a lot of you might be familiar. It's 30 miles north of here on the Flathead Reservation, and I benefited from being in a really rural environment with an actual, a really diverse student body. So uh, 94 students in our high school on my senior year, Six of them were foreign exchange students and roughly half were of Native American heritage. So despite being in a rural, kind of economically underserved area, I did have a wide, diverse student body to benefit from. We also had great teachers, one of whom was here this, this evening, and also my mom who taught there, um, who were really veteran, caring, really dedicated teachers um, who kind of were great at inspiring people to, to go out and explore the world. Um, and I also had great parents, I have to credit them as well, because I knew they'd be here. So. <laughs> <laughs> we had, <laughs> we, had um, we were fortunate enough to host an exchange students. So all these kind of uh, experiences led me to really wanting to explore our world um, and get a better, bigger picture of what the world is. So then I went on to major in political science and French um, at the University of Montana. I sort of took a circuitous route to get there because I actually started out pre-med thinking that I would do the career that I was going to do today, but then I got a C in organic chemistry and that was like, all bets are off, I'm not cut out for this work. So, so I decided to pursue political science thinking I would be better in the diplomatic role and that was kind of my new vision for my career. Um, I spent a year in Nice, France, and during that time, um, my, my grandmother's health was really failing, and she moved in with my parents. And so when I came back from France, um, I uh, had the opportunity to be involved in her care, and I went on to become a CNA, and by then, I knew I was probably committed to, to going back to a career in healthcare. Um, I, I do mention failures and second chances because that's sort of the theme of a lot of the experiences I've had in my career where I'm the runner-up or second runner-up and then things work out okay. Um, so I, I applied for a Fulbright and I didn't get it and it was to go to Senegal. But that's okay because I applied for something else and ended up being uh, awarded that. Um, it, I also at the University of Montana, you know, you have really awesome access to faculty mentors and I had my first research experiences um, in the Department of Political Science, um, where I got to study uh, and work on projects studying the Front National, which at the time was this obscure right-wing French political party, and now it's like this mainstream right-wing political party in France. 
Um, and I also have the opportunity to dabble in the first research projects of global health with um, Professor Kern when he was working on his Fulbright New Century Scholar Award studying um, uh, cultural competency in healthcare providers and refugee populations, which has become even more important today. So after I graduated, I went on to, I actually had to do an extra year to get those requirements for medical school. And during that time, I applied for a grant from the National Institutes of Health that um, it was called the ERDA program, which is the Intermural Research Training Award. Um, because of my background in social science research and being able to speak French, this team of lovely researchers uh, selected me. And it was my first chance to go to Mali because they were looking at how in really rural, underserved areas does occupation play a role in mental health. And they actually said, why don't you come with us? So it was my first chance to travel to Mali, which turned out to be a really pivotal point in my uh, career development. Um, so I went there in 2004. I'll say when I first went there in 2004, there were virtually no cars on the road. And now you can virtually not move because of traffic. So it's really developed and changed rapidly over, over the course of the last 15 years. So um, during that time, I also applied to medical school. Um, I went to the University of Washington um, in Seattle. I did my first year through the WAMI program. I did it in Bozeman, Montana. Um, the neat thing about the University of Washington is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation had already been funded. It was very open to um, allowing you to do global health experiences, and there were lots of those available. Um, and fortunately, I was able to take advantage of um, a different program and apply for a year out research rotation um, in Mali. So in 2007, the spring, like early, early spring of 2007, I applied for the uh, Fogarty International Health Research Scholar Award, and I didn't get it. So I was pretty disappointed, but I decided to move on, and I was going to probably become a family medicine doctor and go back to Ireland. That was my new plan because this didn't work out. And I was on an internal medicine rotation, um, and I got a phone call, and they said, Brianna, would you like to take a position in Mali to um, take the a spot that became open for the Fogarty International Health uh, Scholar Award? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> I didn't hesitate at all. I didn't even have to give it a second thought because I knew it's what I wanted to do. So then I hung up the phone and my next step was of course to call my parents. My dad picked up the phone and I said, Dad, guess what? I'm going to Mali. And he said, Maui, that's great. <laughs> I said, no, Dad, not Maui, Mali, like Timbuktu. To which he said, oh. <laughs> So then I'd remind him that I'd been there before and I had some experience there. So, so with that, he, um, uh, he, he was a little more open to the idea, of course. Um, the, Peter Kern was my mentor, or sorry, um, Chris Plow at that time was my uh, mentor from the University of Maryland and now at Duke. And he is a really a giant in malaria research and uh, was working on developing a really novel approach to malaria vaccine development. Um, but he uh, grew up on the Wounded Knee Reservation in South Dakota, and he said, you know, I would have picked you, but there was somebody who'd already lived in Mali for a couple of years as a Peace Corps volunteer, so I had to pick them first. But when they declined, I thought, you're probably a good runner-up because you've lived in a rural area, so I know what it's like. You'll probably know what it's like, and you'll be able to fit in. So, so that really helped my application, having that background, one, speaking French, but also being from a rural area and kind of knowing what it's like to be lonely sometimes. Um, so a little bit about Mali, and a lot of people know where it's at, so I put it on the map there. It's landlocked West Africa, population of 17.5 million, and a GDP right now around $1,000 a person. Um, life expectancy is quite low, still at 57 uh, years, and that's life expectancy from birth. Fertility rate is really high. It's one of the highest among the world um, at 6 to 7 um, per woman. And the population growth rate is 3%, so really a standing really fast population growth rate right now. And a lot of people think that um, some of the, de the decreased life expectancy in a lot of these countries is from HIV, but Mali really doesn't uh, suffer from the scourge of HIV and AIDS. 
only 0.9% of the population is affected with HIV and AIDS, so really that uh, death rate is reflective on um, under five childhood mortality. So um, I was placed at the Malaria Research and Training Center in Bamako, Mali, which is really a state-of-the-art research facility <coughs> funded by our government and the uh, WHO in conglomeration with um, the Malian government. So it's a really amazing international partnership and they do groundbreaking work. Um, Mali has intense malarial, season malarial transmission. Um, it causes about 15% of childhood mortality and they've made huge inroads into how drug development or how drug resistance develops, what populations would be affected, different approaches to malarial prevention. And I actually got to be on one of those malaria prevention studies. Um, and it was entitled, The Intermittent Preventive Treatment Using our and based Combination <coughs> Therapy, and shows how we reduce malaria morbidity among school children. Sorry, my voice is a little hoarse. <coughs> so I did want to just sort of uh, give a little bit of information about the study I worked on to give you the setting that I was in at the time. So it was a really rural village about 80 kilometers outside of Bamako and I lived in, in, in that little mud hut there. Um, so we didn't have access to running water or electricity but we were still doing really high quality research. Um, our project went to the local school and enrolled 300 children, basically every student in the school in this program where we would give them, whether they had malaria or not, treatment for malaria. And the idea being that we would reduce asymptomatic carriage of the parasite in your blood. So even if they're not sick, some people can carry the parasite and get bitten by a mosquito and transmit it to somebody else and also eventually become sick from it. So we basically treated patients regardless of whether they had malaria for malaria if they were in the treatment arms. And then we had a third arm that was treated just with a placebo vitamin C. And they got those two treatment doses two months apart during the high transmission season. Um, we enrolled a total of 296 students across the three groups. And then they had monthly follow-up, but also we staffed a clinic to the entire village so they could come in with whatever they, whatever ailed them, strep throat, pneumonia, anything. And if they had signs or symptoms of malaria, we would screen them for that and treat them for that as well but we could also do other healthcare for anyone, whether they be an 80-year-old grandmother or a newborn baby that weren't enrolled in the study. And that's part of the benefit to the village um, for accepting a research study into the community. Um, so what we noticed was that there was a dramatic decline in symptomatic malaria cases in the groups that were treated um, in the two-month time frame. In fact, we reduced malaria cases by 66 and 45 percent respectively. We did two different drug combinations to see which one would work best. Mm -hmm. um, this is a strategy now used um, among infants and starting to be used um, in children. So we were one of the first studies to use in school children and now these sorts of programs are actually becoming um, public health policy. So that was kind of fun to be on the cutting edge of one of these um, studies. Um, but while I was working there, as much as you know, I, I love to talk about how the research went really well. What was really challenging was how limited the resources were in the clinic. We had the essential medicines, but we had no way to treat any critical ill patient. And I did have a few really important clinical encounters that really made an impression um, uh, on me and ultimately helped to kind of drive my career forward. Um, I just wanted to read, so I, so I communicated a lot with email, it was dial-up <laughs> internet at the time, of course, I had to walk a couple miles to get to the neighboring research station that had um, email, but uh, while I was, while I would go there to like get a real shower, because <laughs> they had water, <laughs> and also to use the email, so it would take a long time, but I would use email kind of as a therapeutic communication back to the, to the Western world. And I wrote an email home to my, my family and friends, and I think a lot of you actually received this email. So I dug it up from 2007. It says, hello everyone. Uh, I know I promised to slow the onset of emails, but I'm a bit troubled with grief. Yesterday, a four-year-old boy came into the clinic in his father's arms. His father said he was having seizures. He was unconscious and barely breathing. 
Dr. Trory was busy with another patient, so I took the child back to a room where we have three beds. Then he stopped breathing. I started CPR, and time seemed to stand still. I yelled for Bila to come and help. He was the other doctor. I said, this kid's going to die, and then he died right there. I could taste the salt from his face in my mouth, and I started to cry. The, the dad laid his head on the child's chest, picked him up, and walked silently out of the clinic. I ducked away to sob, and the nurse came to comfort me and assured me that this is the way things go. So I went right back to work seeing patients, and then went home and slept for hours. Today things are better, but I dreamt of that child last night. I dreamt that I was mistaken, and that he didn't die, and that we were able to save him. <laughs> Sorry. And today things are better, and I'm back to work tooling away. But I guess I'm realizing that the statistics are real. One in four or five kids will die before their fifth birthday. And then, I'm sorry, I'll catch up. So that was my email home. And I just wanted to show the incredible progress that has been made in this country over the last you know, 50 to 70 years. There's been dramatic declines in the childhood mortality, and this is the good news. So from 1990 to 2015, child mortality was cut in half. This is thanks to immunizations and uh, public health interventions, better treatment, and access to treatment for malaria. Um, we've also worked on things like infant mortality, cutting that nearly in half, and also maintaining a really low rate for HIV transmission. We also see a really amazing trend in the decline in infant mortality. That's children dying before their first birthday. Um, and that has just been a steady downward trend. Really, there's not a single year where you see a bump upward in the last you know, 40 plus years. I did want to, because this is sort of a political science based and things like that, I wanted to talk, talk a little bit about the government structure. So um, Molly has developed a, a structure where um, there's central policy planning, um, but healthcare clinics um, that branch out and all of the smaller hospitals and referral centers actually have a lot of leeway in how they administer care and what they decide to focus on. And it's all based on the local needs there. So even locally, um, a, a, a village clinic might recognize that, boy, we're having a lot of trouble with snake bites. We need to make sure we stock anti-venom. Or we're having a lot of problems with drug-resistant malaria. We need to make sure we stock an appropriate drug. So they have a lot of leeway in determining um, how they operate their clinics. Um, there are four primary hospitals um, that provide tertiary care for a population of 17 million. So that's much less than what, of course, we have here. There are eight regional hospitals that are sort of sub-hospitals that have some specialty care, like general surgery, anesthesia, but would not have things like neurosurgery, um, specialized pediatrics, etc. There are 58 regional um, referral centers that will then feed into all of those regional and national hospitals, and 559 community health centers. So, you know, approximately one per village or village group area. Um, it's about half, they think that they have about half of what they need so far. Um, so we talked a little bit about the national policy and, and how it's dictated in, in Bamako. And, um, and then how it branches out and how the national and a lot of the hospitals have a lot of independence. Um, the community clinics, and that's the kind of clinic I was at, they're called SESCOM. And it, um, most of the community members will actually pay a fee into the SESCOM to have a reduced uh, clinic visit fee. And that's how they pay the physician. So everyone sort of taxes themselves, pays into a system, and then they pay the doctor, or a lot of these are actually staffed by nurse or nurse midwives. Um, and then if you are so sick that you need to be transferred, they'll waive that consultation fee. But this is important because it means that access to care can be, um, the money can be a big barrier. Even coming up with one or two dollars to see the doctor, that's a big barrier for people if they're operating on really thin margins. So unfortunately it has some important consequences that I'll talk about. Um, I'm gonna skip over the research slide here. 
So the key limitations are the overwhelming number of patients per position, um, and then patients presenting really late in illness, like the boy I mentioned. Um, the lack of materials to intervene emergently, and that can be extremely frustrating, especially when you know what's wrong, and you just don't have the ability to treat your patient. Um, we don't, they, you know, most clinics don't have ventilators or access to dialysis or a lot of these life-saving interventions that we use every day. Um, the lack of diagnostics outside of major hospitals is a major problem too. So, you know, a lot of times people are going to be diagnosed with what can be treated in that setting. So, a child might present with leukemia, but they just keep getting treated for malaria because they're presenting with fevers, weakness, and anemia, which are similar to the symptoms of malaria. So leukemia and malaria might be really late before a kid actually shows up and gets the diagnosis of leukemia, if they make it. Um, uh, there's a lack of medical specialists. At the time that I was there in 2007, um, <clears throat> there was one neurosurgeon for the entire country. So, and he, he, he can't be on all the time, right? So there's one neurosurgeon, so if you had any kind of head trauma, your chances of survival are, I mean, almost nothing, unless that neurosurgeon, one, is available and you are rapidly diagnosed and, and near uh, a hospital where he could operate. So surgical care, major issue. Um, and then unfortunately in 2011, a rowdy um, captain in the Malian military got this Yehu idea to go and overthrow the president a month before the election, and the president was had every intention of leaving office and had, had not even posted for for being reelected. But he got overthrown, and that led to a series of really awful events. And this was happening at the same time that Muammar Gaddafi was overthrown in northern Mali or in Libya, and so people left Libya with a lot of Gaddafi's weapons and invaded northern Mali and set up sort of a pseudo state there that they're still struggling with today. And so Al-Qaeda is very much still in the north part of Mali. And it's a very dangerous area, and um, our organization doesn't operate there. Hey, yeah. mm -hmm. I think the mic is like... Oh, okay. Sorry. Is that better? Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. oh have you guys been having a hard time here? I'm so sorry. I feel like I'm talking really loud. Well, that's a good thing. Cause okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So... Um, once I ended my field study uh, portion of my research year, I went back to the capital um, in Mali. I was really inspired by the clinical care and also recognized my profound lack of adequate clinical knowledge to take care of an acutely ill child. And so I wanted to have more experience there and I went to the um, pediatric ward at Gabrielle Touré. Um, and there were a lot more patient tragedies. In the, in the morning, we would start rounds with a summary of all the patients that died overnight, and I would say anywhere between four and six every night would die. And it, and it was really very heart-wrenching to, to have to cope with losing a patient that you just met the day before, but it really was just from at lack of access to care. Um, like, they're there, but I'll talk a little bit more about what it means to actually be at the hospital. Um, so. You are a parent, and you bring your actively seizing child into the pediatric emergency room, and you lay your child on the bed, and we can see they're seizing, and so the doctor will say, you need an anti-seizure medicine, and you need some normal saline, and they'll write out a list and, with a prescription and hand it to the parent, and the parent has to go to the pharmacy and get those medicines, and then come back so we can administer them. When a child has a life-threatening illness, this is inadequate and inefficient, but it, it really is the reality um, on the ground. Now, we're making huge improvements there. I'll talk a little bit about that, but that was the reality when I first started working. Um, and even if the family was able to do that, the ongoing care burden could bankrupt a family within days. So if you're working with 30 to $40 a month of income, and we tell you you need to go get $40 in medical supplies, that means the rest of the family isn't going to eat that month. So they have to make really heart-wrenching decisions about withdrawing care or even leaving the hospital because they can't afford to take care of their kid. And so during this time, of course, it's kind of an emotional experience for me, and I made a lot of friends with other medical students, and, and ultimately I met my husband, <laughs> who um, I, I'll mention that later, but made some really meaningful con connections with physicians there. And I eventually, um, 
decided that we needed to do more, and we probably could do more. So I wrote another email home, and I promise I won't get choked up with this one. Um, so hi, friends and family. I'm wrapping up my year here in Bali. It's been nothing short of incredible, and I have learned a ton. And I'm almost nervous about coming home. Culture shock awaits. I recently started working in pediatrics ward here in Bamako. It's the national hospital. <coughs> Things are pretty tough here as it's meningitis season. Lots of very sick kids. And lots of kids dying because they can't cover the cost of medicines. At least 20 this week. So I guess this is where my plea comes in. I hate asking for money, but I was wondering if any of you might consider sending 5 or $10 to help fund any medical care when parents can't step in. Um, as an example, today the cost of treating one child's septicemia, that's a life-threatening infection of the bloodstream, was $60. Meningitis, about $15. And pneumonia, about $15. It is only acute hospital care that will be covered but I can at least get a few kids out of the hospital and back to normal life. I'll keep exact accounting so that you know where your money goes. So I expected to get maybe a couple hundred dollars, and my friends and family, many of whom are here tonight, responded in kind, and we had $4,000 by the end of the week. One of our neighbors sent us his tax return, and a friend of mine from Canada sent me $1,000 on a whim because she just got a new job and had a bonus. So it, it was amazing. So now, rounding in the hospital was a lot more fun. <laughs> so, um, a big problem, like as a medical student, is you might uh, meet a patient, they have symptoms, you propose a hypothesis, and you have to order tests to, te to see what, if you're right. Um, we couldn't do that because the families couldn't afford, if they could afford treatment, they still couldn't even afford the workup to figure out what was wrong. So, now we could do that. Um, and uh, we would do a simple investigation into resources to make sure no one was taking advantage of the fund. Um, and then we would take the prescriptions that weren't being filled or the medical tests that weren't being paid for and just go out and buy them, like me and the other medical students on the team. And then we would bring the medicines back to bedside and the nurses would then administer them. Um, then uh, we would do follow-up at regular intervals to make sure that our care was adequate and that we were caring for the patient as they evolved. Um, and we even did post-hospital care and post-hospital follow-up to make sure our patients did well even at home. And that's how Molly Medical Relief was born. This is the organization that we founded in um, 2007. Um, our treasurer is here tonight, Ethel McDonald. And that's her up there with a, a picture in one of the villages with a boa constrictor around her neck. <laughs> I was assured that it was safe. <laughs> um, I maintained really uh, tight bonds with a lot of the uh, medical students there that are now practicing physicians including my husband, Paul Kamate, who lives and works in Spokane, and Zachary Sai, who's a, a pediatric uh, surgeon who went and did specialty training abroad. Um, the logistics end of thing, initially we actually were a uh, little subsidiary of the Janet Reagan Peace Center here in Missoula, um, and then we became our own 501c3 about three years later. But we, and then in, in the beginning we saw really small but sustained growth um, and just sort of maintained a repertoire of about 30 to 40 patients until the last few years when I've had more time to dedicate to growing um, bigger. Um, so we're funded by friends and family. We're funded by a lot of you, so thank you. Um, it continues in operation today. We're, we just celebrated our 10th anniversary last April. Um, we're now caring for hundreds of patients a year. So this last year we saw 355 patients. We primarily cover hospitalizations, surgeries, and critical medicines. Um, what I'm really proud of is that we use only local resources on the ground, and so this also contributes to continued development of the health infrastructure. Um, as an example, um, some medical teams that come in and do a bunch of work and then fly home, um, they may actually be taking away from the patient base that's supporting the specialist surgeon there on the ground, and instead we're able to actually use the local expertise um, and use only local physicians, local resources, and locally available care. Um, there was, I mentioned there was one neurosurgeon in um, 2007, and there are now seven neurosurgeons that we can refer to, including orthopedic trauma specialists. I mean, the growth has been incredible. Last year, Molly opened one of the only open heart center, open heart surgery centers um, in all of West Africa, and that's despite having um, incredible instability in the north. So they have really invested in their health infrastructure. So we started with about a budget of about $4,000 in that first year. 
Um, and now we're near 25,000 or so, 25 to $30,000 of operating expenses a year. And we're zero overhead. So we're all volunteer, none of us take a paycheck, none of us take a cut. And any of the very nominal expenses like you know, printing out flyers or our website is just paid for by members of the board. And that includes people on the ground in Mali who are also very inspired by our work. Um, so we work in Bamako at the major hospitals there. So um, there's four major hospitals that we get referrals from there. And they're run by, uh, right now, the project is run by two extremely dedicated physicians, um, Dr. Jallo and Dr. Sila, who have been phenomenal um, in their ability to, to manage cases and continue our growth and continue new outposts into where we can help um, new patients. Um, we also work in Joyla, that's the smaller town where my husband's from, where we have a different um, operating structure there. We use a local board um, that gets referrals from hospital physicians and all the expenses are then run through the board. And that collectivity um, helps prevent graft and things that might, you might consider to be at risk. And then we also intermittently run a small clinic out of, or not run a clinic, but see, fee, uh, fund patient um, interventions in Bandia Gara, but we've really tapered off there because of security in the north. Um, we also do really culturally competent care because it's all, um, I had to do a shout out for this, <laughs> um, because uh, we use like the local physicians and local population and people seem to be a lot more comfortable in communicating some of their concerns um, through people that you know can speak their own language and they can tell us, you know, give us good feedback and honest feedback because um, we're using people that speak the local language and know the local culture. Um, so these are just some photos of the hospitals where we work. This is Point G, the National Hospital. Um, and these are the pediatric wards in um, Hospital of Mali and um, Gabrielle Touré. And this is our referral hospital that we work out of um, in Joyla. And so this is the current kind of administrative staff of Mali Medical Relief Fund. Um, Dr. Jallo and Dr. Sila are the primary um, operating officers in Bamako, and Mark Travassos is a member of our board and he's a pediatric infectious disease specialist in um, Baltimore, Maryland, but does a lot of research in Mali, so he does a lot of our site follow-up visits and able to, to do some audits of our care. And then of course our team up here in Joyla, that's myself, my husband Paul, and my dad, um, and then the local board members, two of the local board members and a friend, and then of course Ethel our wonderful treasurer who's been with us since the beginning and really helped us get our start because she put us in touch with her son who had been working at Microsoft and we were able to get some matching donations that way. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the fun first cases. Um, there's an eight-year-old boy with a crush injury and amputation and for $300 we provided the amputation surgery because his leg was not viable after the injury and um, the prosthesis. Just to put that in perspective, it would probably cost $300,000, upwards of $300,000 to do the same intervention in the United States. Um, and we had a six-year-old boy with an astrocytoma along his optic nerve, and for $250, we were able to diagnose that by CT scan and operate, um, and, and saved his life, potentially, from that. So, um, really amazing interventions for just pennies on a dollar compared to what we can do here. Um, we work to improve care and access to care because we're driving local demand. So um, we pay for a lot of the neonates that have a, a condition called hydrocephalus um, because we're paying for a lot of those uh, VP shunts or ventricular peritoneal shunts that get placed. And that's a conduit from the brain to your abdomen to drain extra pressure um, from around your brain. Um, we're also improving the training experience. I kind of uh, mentioned that earlier, but um, if patients are able to have a workup, you learn more because sometimes you're wrong. You know, you test your hypothesis and wow, that's not it, it's this. So, we, so we're able to kind of continue helping with medical education. Um, we're always there. We're available 24 seven really because everyone has the number to the, to the staff that, that, that work with us in Mali. Um, and uh, we actually have surpassed what the local government is able to fund in charity care. So at uh, Gabrielle Touré, the national um, government provided about 5,000 in charity care 
Um, and we are now at the $25,000 operating mark. So that $5,000 runs out really quick, and we basically serve as a cushion to, to soften the blow. Um, every dollar goes to patient care, um, and then we have slated donations from um, board members to cover our minimal operating expenses. And so I talked a little bit about who's running the show now, Dr. Sila and Dr. Jallo. My primary role right now is approving um, patient cases, like large surgical cases and things like that. I'll do a chart review and make sure it's appropriate for us to be able to cover that. Um, and then I also do the fundraising and promotion. Um, we do needs assessments periodically with staff, and um, they actually have fantastic, they bring fantastic new ideas, like they linked us up this year with the Pediatric Oncology Unit, where another NGO is covering chemotherapy for patients, and we're paying for the workup. So we'll cover the cost of the CT scans and blood work that they need, and then the other NGO will take over with the chemotherapy. Um, and we use new ventures based on, on local demand, and then we do periodic audits and assessments to make sure we're not just dumping money into a hole somewhere. Um, uh, my, my husband visits not infrequently, and then Mark Travassos also visits not infrequently. And so they'll actually go to the homes of patients that have benefited from our care um, and meet with patients that are currently on the hospital wards benefiting from, from the care we're providing. Um, so our last fiscal year, we had some pretty, this is um, the last, Three years in a row, we've doubled, or we've had 50% growth uh, for the last three years. So this year we saw 355 patients, and that covered 2,826 hospital days. Um, that would be upwards of you know a few million dollars here in the states. Um, our total expenditures was 27,500, and our average patient cost was roughly 78 dollars. 65% um, of our patients are under 12 years of age, and we covered 21 major surgeries, and that includes spinal fusion, major abdominal surgeries, like uh, diverting colostomies, and um, yeah, <laughs> a little more probably information you want to know, but it's pretty impressive what they can do. <laughs> um, we have ventured into neurosurgery and orthopedic care and really trying to improve trauma care because that's where we can make it a new, bigger impact uh, is trying to, to save people from life-threatening injuries. Um, and we've even purchased durable equipment that was one of the needs assessments that they did in the trauma unit. They said, you know, kids are getting amputations unnecessarily because they're not getting surgery early enough for open fractures. That's when you have a break in the bone and bacteria get in and set up an infection. And a lot of times your limb will become non-viable if it's not operated on quickly. And they weren't able to operate on quickly because they lacked the external fixation device to keep the surgical repair in place. And so they were holding off on operating on these kids because they had to wait until the last person that had an x fix on had, had that removed. So we purchased external fixation devices to try to um, improve the amputation rate um, on the pediatric uh, trauma uh, ward. And then we also provide referral surges, services because we can't do everything. We can't pay for like long-term dialysis. We can't pay for transplants. We can't pay for major um, uh, some major uh, spinal surgeries and things like that, you know, that we just don't have the uh, means to cover the hardware or the long-term hospital rehab, but certain organizations do, um, and so we can make referrals that way. So here are some happy patients. This young gentleman was diagnosed and treated successfully with leukemia this year, and this 15-month-old child here had a major abdominal surgery. Um, she had a condition called Hirschsprungs, and she had a total colectomy with an ostomy. And this uh, child is status post repair of an encephalocele. It's like a large uh, defect in the skull that leads to um, a long-term defect, and so that's her um, after repair, and, and she'll actually probably have like a stage <coughs> repair. Um, and then another child that is getting fitted for a prosthesis, um, she had a really unfortunate story. Um, she and her mother were struck by a car, her mother died, um, and then she lost her leg in the accident. And so we provided um, the, the surgery and the um, prosthesis, and then actually a lot of long-term like support care, because they, they really um, had really struggled financially as a family after that. Um, the biggest, probably, important intervention that we have, aside from the surgical and medical care that we do, we actually staff 
um, and stock an emergency pharmacy because that was the biggest glaring hole there was just when you need normal saline to resuscitate a child, <laughs> it's got to be there now. Um, and that's what we do. We actually stock it with anti-seizure medicines. We stock it with antibiotics and um, normal saline, which is something to use to raise your blood pressure when you're acutely dehydrated or have lost a lot of blood. Um, and any physician that's staffing the EPZR at night can have access to that. Just open it, open the... Um, closet that it's in and just write the name of the patient and how much they took and when. And basically it provides for, it kind of bridges that gap that I was talking about when patients come in and you're writing a prescription for critical medicines and then waiting. So you don't have to wait. Um, a lot of what we see is cerebral malaria because general malaria is actually funded and treated by the Malian government, but if a case presents too late and has progressed to cerebral malaria, um, we will take that patient on our roster if they need it. Um, and then also lots of complications from sickle cell disease. Um, here is a child with a diverting colostomy, a little 15-month-old child, and she had a condition called imperforate anus, basically she was born without an anal opening, and she would have died of that. And it's such a relatively routine and simple surgical, well, I don't say simple surgical, but a fairly routine pediatric surgical intervention. And um, we were able to do that for her, and now she's good. Another condition that we'll see is a caustic ingestion. Caustic ingestion occurs because a lot of women in Mali make soap, and they also dye clothing for a living. And they use a soda ash and lye, and the children will get curious and put it in their mouth and then scar their esophagus down and be unable to swallow. And so they'll need um, a G2 placement for the rest of their lives, usually. Um, and we'll provide that, that care. So how does this all fit together? So, um, of course, in the meantime, while I was running the organization, um, I did a pediatric residency from 2009 to 2012, and we became an independent NGO in 2011. Um, I did a pediatric emergency medicine fellowship in 2012 to 2015, and I was able to keep going back um, because my research years and my research focus was actually based in Mali um, on the PERCH study, which I know you guys heard about a couple, <laughs> a couple lectures ago, and um, a Thrasher grant um, that allowed me to keep going back and forth to Mali that kept me in touch with um, everyone. And now I'm back in the Inland Southwest, and this is my family. Um, and I'm an attending physician in the pediatric ER. That's my day job. Um, and I'm clinical faculty at U UW teaching medical students. And of course, my passion is running MMRF and making sure we grow. And we've done pretty well over the last three years. I hope we continue to do so. So just to sum it up, you know, there's lots of ways to get into a career in global health. I kind of took a little long way around. Um, Molly has seen impressive improvements um, in the last 25 years in terms of their, their health care. Um, and we hope to continue to build on that. Um, we use local resources and invest in the local economy and the local medical infrastructure, which I think makes us really sustainable. And it also prevents us from having to close up shop when instability erupts, because the doctors are going to stay, they're not going anywhere. Um, and so when conflict arises, we know we can stay on the ground and we'll still be there. Um, and then of course, if you're a second runner-up, <laughs> there's always a chance that things will work out. So, <laughs> and this is... Um, uh, the website and our Gmail address and also uh, like us on Facebook and we're on Amazon Smile at Christmas time. I think about Amazon Smile. Okay. Any questions? Thank you, Brianna. Well, how many donors are there now? They have 50. I think I filled out 50 or 75 thank you letters this year. Yeah. Um, uh, doctors Jalan and Silla, are they government employees? Yes. Yeah. And they do this just basically on the side. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing, if you could talk a little bit, you, you said that <clears throat> the medical missions have unintended consequences sometimes. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, the idea is that, and it was really well worded by a uh, pediatric orthopedic surgeon that had given a lecture, and he's like, 
you know, you might actually be taking away the only paying patients um, from a local surgeon if you come in and swoop in and don't work with the local community well. Like if you kind of come in and do um, your specialty surgery, say, a common thing might be cataracts. So there's a state-of-the-art um, eye hospital in Bamako. So it would be a really poor choice to go and come in and do a bunch of cataract surgeries when there's already operating ophthalmologists there um, that are really great. They can do you know several a day um, already. And so you're almost provide like a competing resource um, for patients um, and sometimes competing economic resource as well. Um, so really partnering with the local, if you're going to come in, I like encourage medical groups to make sure they partner with the local physicians and nurses um, because they know they, their specialty trend and they know their region and they know their people and have a lot to, to offer and give. One final question. Um, what does a physician make and how serious has the brain drain been? So um, Molly fights brain drain. Um, pretty aggressively by refusing to release medical diplomas of recent medical graduates for at least five years after graduation. Uh. <laughs> so our own, my own family has actually suffered the consequences of that because um, my husband left uh, Molly to become married to me and had planned to do a medical residency, but they wouldn't release his diploma. Um, and then the government was overthrown and then it got delayed even more. And, Finally, 10 years had passed and finally he got his diploma. And by then, 10 years post-medical school graduation, it'd be really tough to get into a residency here in the States. So that was a big barrier, but that's one of the ways they do it. Um, to answer your salary question, it can really vary widely. So people staffing private clinics and catering to wealthy patients can do pretty well, a few hundred dollars a day. But I'd say the average physician is somewhere between two and five hundred dollars a month. <coughs> And medical students actually have a little stipend, and it's about thirty dollars a month. So people are operating really on the margins that are that are covering the the hospital. And residents actually have, are not paid here in the states. We're paid as residents, but residents are not paid there. They actually have to pay for the privilege to do a residency, and so that puts a lot of pressure on uh, that puts a lot of downward pressure on people wanting to specialize. How are you keeping your physicians, the ones that work for you? And is that sustainable? Well, that's a good question. We come up on this every year. Um, we, uh, well, he, he, um, so we asked, how do we keep the, our local physicians happy, the ones that work for us? It comes up kind of every year about how we're going to take good care of our people and to make sure they still want to do it. And so I periodically just ask them, like, are you, do you still have the energy to do this? And they reassure me that they do. Um, but we used, um, we had a large uh, donor. Then we were able to set aside a, a sum of money to kind of become more of a foundation type system where we can actually draw on interest and we use some of the accrued interest uh, to pay to go to the, um, to send one of Dr. Giallo to the Unite for Sight conference um, that happens every year at Yale um, to kind of get ideas about how to grow our organization and create some sustainability. Um, and so that was one of the benefits we've provided for him. And then we do um, pay about forty dollars a month in transportation fees to cover the, like cover his you know nominal expenses. Um, but they always reassure me that no, this is just part of what they really like to do, um, and that they don't want to take anything from the, the patient contact. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I just had a question about. Um, you administered CPR. Mm -hmm. Like when my dad died, it took about 45 minutes for the CPR people to come and do their thing and take them to the hospital. But how yeah. much time did it take from the time that you did the CPR and just decided, well, you know, you gotta let them go? Well, we just didn't have any way to support an airway. There was no backup medical team that was gonna come. Okay. We had no way to administer things like the CMIC epinephrine. So there's no endpoint there. We could have done CPR for hours. And it, you know, it wouldn't have made a difference, unfortunately. But yes, that's an excellent question. And that actually speaks to, you know, as a third year medical student, you have a lot of good medical knowledge and background, but the clinical experience of, of having to independently take care of critically ill patients, I did not have that knowledge base at all. Yes. Um, how has your experience affected your view of the US healthcare system? 
Um, that's such a tough question. So uh, we do a lot of wasteful um, testing. Um, and that's the reality. We do a lot of uh, probably unnecessary uh, testing to uh, reassure families that don't want to just take your word for it. Um, we do a lot of um, probably uh, expensive tests that would not even be available in this setting. Um, but also there is a lot of excess cost just built into our system that I'm not really sure where all that money goes. <laughs> um, there's, you know, there's literally offices set up with people to take phone calls to people calling and complaining about their bills. Well, that costs money too, so that gets built back to the patient, right? I mean, there's just this huge cycle of waste that occurs in the U.S. And, and here, there's no waste, but, it, you know, we're just not to the quality of care that we can provide here yet. I was wondering if you um, have any idea how the blood supply works in Mali, especially if you're starting to focus on dealing with trauma and um, if some places are doing open heart surgery. Yeah, so there's a blood bank in Bamako, and they do the same you know, screening that we would do for blood here in the United States, and CMV, EBV, HIV, Hep C, all of the you know, testable, transmittable infections. Um, blood would not be available probably even at the regional hospital level. Maybe. If they're doing surgeries, they probably have blood. Um, but really, that's, I, we had to transfer a patient with severe anemia um, you know, 160 km kilometers out of where we were at to be able to, to give blood, to get him to give blood. And I'll tell you, at the time when I was working, the blood supply was so low that they required that if your child was going to get a blood transfusion, you had to go give blood. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the things that's very, very challenging and very difficult, but important, especially for donors, is some kind of impact evaluation. Yeah. Uh, there's so many confounding factors. Are you able to do any impact evaluation with what your particular intervention has resulted in? So that's a, oh, sorry. Can you repeat the question? So um, in terms of getting people to donate, people want to know what's the impact, what impact are we having? Like, yes, we're treating lots of patients. I can tell you patients we're treating, but what's the actual impact on the ground? Um, we're actually starting something new this year where we're collecting a lot more data, um, if parents allow, um, on uh, resources that are within the family, number of people within the family, the condition patients are coming in with, et cetera. Um, but that's really something new in terms of um, being able to do a better assessment of our own work. And that raises another question in my mind, which is, um, you know, we, we always, sometimes when practitioners do the kinds of work that you do, they overlook the fact that uh, what really is going on here is social determinants of health. Do you try to address any of them? I mean, from your political science background, you know what that's all about. Do yeah. you ever try to address any of the social contributors? Like in terms of an intervention? Yeah, in terms of things like, well, most basically, like poverty and how do you overcome yeah. those kinds of social determinants that are really the major reason why people have some of these social health problems. We don't do any like population-wide interventions. We really are a pop-off valve for, for do you do any advocacy, though? Do you do any advocacy on behalf of patients with the government, with, uh, except for donors, of course, you do that? Yeah, not yet, no. I wouldn't say we do a lot of advocacy other than informing the different services within a given hospital of our availability to help. Um, we have not done a lot of advertising on the ground because really, unless we had a fund upwards of several million dollars, right, there's going to be an incredible wave of demand. So really it is sort of an unspoken, you know, everyone knows it's in the club, knows about our resource, but it's not like a population-wide um, knowledge of our, our resource. A little add-on to that question. Is the Ministry of Health, uh, do they collect any information, demographic, socioeconomic, information on the, say, the childhood mortality? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, the current um, Minister of Health is actually um, uh, a colleague um, of mine and my husband's from 
back at the University of Maryland. It's, it's one of the Pete's IDs, Pete's ID um, physicians. It's her husband that's the current Minister of Health. And they do a lot of data collection. Um, the Center for Vaccine Development is based in Bamako, and they uh, do a lot of population-wide studies. In fact, the University of Maryland ha um, has probably as much data as anybody um, on population health in Mali. Well, I guess it turns out that there are only a few things that they can concentrate on, like malaria, which they yeah. know are big. Um, well, the Global yeah. Fund um, obviously does uh, tuberculosis, HIV, and malaria, but they funded uh, research studies and immunization campaigns for Haemophilus influenza B vaccine um, implementation, uh, pneumococcal vaccine implementation, um, improving access to seasonal chemoprophylaxis, which used to be called IPTSC and is now called seasonal um, chemoprophylaxis. Um, I mean, there, there's lots of interventions um, on the ground and lots of teams that, that work there. You talked a lot about trauma. Is, um is one of the issues uh, vehicle accidents and uh, mm -hmm. road conditions? Yeah, so um, moped is a primary source of transportation. So and they'll, they could be you know, up to three or four people on a single scooter, frequently not helmeted, driving at high speeds, competing on highways with semi-trucks and cars. Um, and so trauma actually is a major issue. And a lot of what we pay for, because it's extremely expensive when you have a pelvic fracture and an arm fracture and a brain, brain bleed and you need a blood transfusion. I mean, trauma care, even here in the States, is extremely resource intensive. And um, a lot of times, patients aren't even conscious to be able to pay for those services, so someone has to step in. And it's obviously very time limited, right? You can, a cancer diagnosis might take a long time to, to make, but uh, when trauma presents, it has to be immediately addressed. <coughs> We have a last in, question. In the trauma, you mentioned also burn. Um, yeah. And uh, could you talk a little bit about that too? Is that as frequent as the trauma accidents now? Are the trauma accidents now more frequent since there is not as much walking? Yeah, um, that's a good question. You know, I don't know like the whole trend in, in how many burn patients they see or how many certain types. I just know when I get referred a case. Um, so I don't know a lot about exactly, because I'm not on the ground anymore, so I'm not um, seeing the patients myself to kind of get a feel for what, what the major problems are. Um, but I do know that we took on a few burn patients this year, which was something we had not done before. Um, burn patients obviously require, require very specialized care, which can be really challenging um, in, in Mali because of the risks of nosocomial or hospital-based infections. Um, and so I just mentioned that because the, the trauma docs that were taking care of burn patients reached out um, to us and asked us to care for a couple of patients. Well, thank you everyone for well, hold coming on and supporting Before we thank you, I want to make uh, one announcement about next week's lecture. So uh, we're going to stay with Africa next week um, and we're going to have a talk by Chris Ziegler who's right here. Uh, he's going to talk about some of the work that he's doing in Sierra Leone. Better be two weeks. Um, I'm sorry. Very <laughs> Next week, there's no lecture because it's spring break. It's two weeks from now. It'll be April 3rd. Um, and uh, Chris is going to unlock for us the secret ingredient in international development. So I can't wait because I teach a course on international development. So I'm going to have to pay special attention uh, two weeks from tonight. Uh, so please, please join me. You know, this was really a, a fantastic talk. Um, I, I just can't tell you how much I learned from what Brianna shared with us and how impressed I am with how she was able to use, you know, a fairly modest amount of resources uh, to make some really amazing contributions in Mali. She and, and others, of course, not just her alone. Uh, and thanks to her support group as well. They deserve part of the credit for that. Um, and, uh, you know, this is one of the reasons why we have this lecture series because I think it's, uh, you know, a lot of the things that people in, who come out of Montana, who have Montana roots are doing around the world, just lie behind, below the radar screen. And so we want to make sure that others know about the kinds of things that people from Montana are doing. And Brianna's a great example of that. And. Uh, it's great that this will be posted now up on our, on our website for people to look at even if they couldn't come tonight.
And if you haven't already signed in, make sure you sign in before you leave today. There's a community roster and a student roster. So please join me in thanking Brianna for this one.